Hello everybody, it's really fantastic to welcome you all here today. My name is Jane Churchill and I have the wonderful job of programming the children's events for the Stroud Book Festival. Today I'm really thrilled to be introducing Abby Elphinstone. She's an amazing author and if you haven't already read her, I urge you to do so straight away. Today she's going to be talking about Jungle Drop, which is actually the second book in her Unmapped Chronicle sequence. The first book is Rumble Star, and you might like to start with that one and then go on to Jungle Drop, but you can read them in any order. I think you're going to be in for a really fantastic session, so sit back and enjoy yourselves. Hello to all the Stroud and Gloucestershire schools watching and to others from further away. I'm Abby Elphinstone and I write fast paced adventure books with a little bit of magic. Now, when I was at school, when I was your age, I used to think that the people who got to become authors were the people that were so unbelievably clever that they just looked at a blank sheet of paper and then a story tumbled out. But the more writing I've done, the more authors I've met, I've realised that is not it at all. All you guys need to write an incredible story is an idea that nobody else has stumbled across yet. And I like to find my ideas through adventures, both close to home and far, far away, and through accidental daydreams. So today I'm going to talk to you about the adventures behind my books and show you some props behind my books. And then I'm going to answer some of your questions at the end. So I'm kicking off with a question for you guys. Do you think when I was in year two that I wanted to be an author when I was older? So hands up for yes, you wanted to be an author. Hands up for no. Right. <laughs> no is the right answer. Um, I didn't want to become an author when I was in year two. I wanted, as you can see from this next slide, to be a unicorn. So when I realised that this was ridiculous and I wasn't going to make much money or many friends, I decided to rethink things completely. I became a teacher. And it was when I was teaching English that I thought back to the books I loved when I was your age, the books with short chapters and big adventures, and I thought, I want to write one of those. So the first thing I did when I sat down to write a book was I thought back to where I'd grown up. I grew up in the middle of nowhere in Scotland, as you can see from this slide here. I spent my weekends scrambling over the moors, building dens in the woods, looking for hidden waterfalls and eagles eyries in glens. And I ended up using every single place that I explored as a child in a book years later. So this was my very first book, The Dream Snatcher. It's the first book in a trilogy. It goes Dream Snatcher, and then you've got Shadow Keeper and Night Spinner. Every single place in these books, somewhere I explored as a child. So in light of that, I wonder if you can tell me who you think this is in the next slide. So the last school I spoke to said, is it God in Wellington boots? And one kid said, is it a giant ape? It is not a giant ape, it's my dad. And that photo was taken when I was in year five and he climbed to the top of a hazel tree and he chopped down a branch and he gave it to me. And I was like, oh, thanks for the branch, Dad. And he said, see if you can carve it into a catapult. So a few hours later, I had this. So this is the catapult carved from hazel wood. Hazel's really strong. So if you want to make a bow and arrow or, arrow or a catapult out of wood, hazel's a good one to make it out of. And then I just got some rubber, some tubing here, a pouch of leather from my shoe and a rubber band and a hair bobble. And if you put a pouch, uh, a pebble in the back in that pouch and pull back to your jaw, you can fire. So I didn't think anything of it when I was in year five. I just thought it was a cool thing to do with my dad. And then years later, when I wrote this book, The Dream Snatcher, I ended up using the catapult as a feature of the book. So in The Dream Snatcher, um, three kids are living wild in the woods and they're armed with catapults that was drawn from my childhood with my dad and a wild cat and tons of magic. And they have to find the three amulets of truth objects steeped in riddles and heaped in curses before the shadow masks a group of sinister witch doctors do. So wherever you are, pinch the rivers, borrow the woods, steal the street names and pop them into stories of your own, just like this catapult ended up. Um, I once pinched, let me see if I can find it here, yes, I pinched a character name, Moll Pecksniff, from a shower gel in, C in TK Maxx. I was shopping and I came across this shower gel, Peck sniff. 
and I thought that's a stupid name for a shower gel, but quite a cool name for a character. So yeah, the heroine of the Dream Snatcher is called Moll Pecksniff, named after a shower gel. So you, you can pinch names, character names, ideas for worlds anywhere. Um, you can use ideas from inside your own home. You don't need to go out to the shops or climb a tree. Um, I spilt a whole load of yoghurt the other day. I opened the fridge door and the yoghurt tumbled out and it went <laughs> onto the floor. And I was looking at the dollops of yoghurt and I thought, dollop is a great word. No one uses dollop that much. And so I've called a character in my latest book, the one that comes out in May, it's called The Crackle Dawn Dragon. I've called a goblin dollop inside it. Um, and then the other day my toddler had a really bad nightmare and I heard him crying in the night so I ran up the stairs I was like what's wrong and before I'd even got to him he was still asleep he was crying out in his sleep saying don't cut my toenails so weird <laughs> and I ended up using that phrase don't cut my toenails in a book recently um, as part of a sort of joke so you can steal anything something your sibling says randomly in the middle of the night fallen yogurt out of a fridge. Now let's see what we've got next. Um, the next slide, here we go, is about a book that I wrote um, after an adventure far, far away. So The Dream Snatcher was inspired by adventures close to home. In Sky Song, I travelled a little further afield to write the book. Um, I came across this next photo here. Um, I remember looking at this photo thinking it was really cool and wondering what was going on in this photo. So I scrolled down the article and I looked at the caption underneath the photo and it said there was a tribe of people in Mongolia called the Kazakh Eagle Hunters. They use golden eagles to hunt for them and when the golden eagle is ready to mate they release it back into the wild so that it can have a family of its own. So they treat the eagles really, really well. And I thought that was quite interesting. And I saw the next line and it said, every single person in this tribe is a man or a boy. And I thought, well, that's a bit rubbish. Where are all the girls? But then this photo made sense because it said, there is one girl, one girl in this tribe of Kazakh eagle hunters. And she's called Aishalpan and she's 12 years old. When I saw that sentence, I thought, now that is a heroine waiting to be written about. That girl belongs in my next book. And what if I could get out to Mongolia to find her and write her story? So Sky Song ends up being a book about an eagle huntress, an inventor boy, and an organ made of icicles. It's also a story about belonging, even at the very edges of our world. Um, so I was lucky enough to get out to Mongolia and to try and find this girl, Aishalpan. I knew that there was an eagle, hunt eagle hunting festival happening on one date in one particular place. And I thought if I can get there, I might be in with a chance of meeting this girl. But I had to trek through lots and lots of wild places before I got to that place. So as you can see from this first slide of my adventures in Mongolia, um, I had to trek through Bear Valley. Even the name Bear Valley is so wonderful, you could just steal it straight away and put it in a book of your own. So I camped in Bear Valley in a ger, G-E-R, a little felt house, not obviously this size. The last school I spoke to said, you were tiny in Mongolia. Um, basically, this would be about the size of half of a classroom, perhaps, so quite big. And it was so perishingly cold at night that in the middle of the night, my eyelashes froze shut. My water bottle was just a clump of ice when I awoke in the morning. And when I stepped out of the gur when the sun had risen, I was surrounded by snow. And in the snow, there were the footprints of wolves. They hadn't been there when I went to bed. So the wolves must have come down in the middle of the night and come from the valley perhaps around us, circled our camp and then left. And that's what I love about the wild. It can come secretly, silently. Sometimes the only reason you know it's come in the first place is because there's a footprint in the snow the next morning. So I went out to Mongolia to try and find out about eagles and eagle huntresses, but I ended up finding out loads about wolves. And the guide I was with gave me this, which is a wolf fang decorated with silver and a jewel. And I ended up 
using this item um, when I was creating one of my characters, the inventor boy called Flint. He wears something very similar to this as an earring. And that's what Mongolian women did. They made these, these jewel encrusted um, wolf fangs and turned them into earrings and necklaces. So um, I went on and on through the wilderness to try and find Aishalpan and eventually I found her. You can see in this next slide, there we go, is a photo of me with Aishalpan, the only eagle huntress, and she took me hunting with her. So we rode on horses and Aishalpan had the golden eagle on her arm, seven kilograms in weight, two meters wingspan, it's huge, and there she is, year six girl, carrying this eagle. And we rode up to the top of a mountain, and then Aishalpan loosed her golden eagle at the top, and it circled in the sky, and then it dived. I wonder if you can think of what animal the eagle might have dived for. Um, one kid at the last school I spoke to said rhino. Can you imagine the golden eagle diving down for a rhino for Aishalpan's tea? Um, another kid said a mouse. Um, I think it would be a bit disappointing dive. If you dive all the way down and then you've got this tiny mouse. Um, so it's somewhere in between a rhino and a mouse. It's actually a fox, a marmot, they're like giant gerbily hamster things, or wolves. So these golden eagles plummet out of the sky. They dive on these animals. And then the huntress, like Aishalpan, uses the fur from these animals to make coats and hats to keep warm. So we wouldn't wear real fur now, it's considered immoral, illegal in some places. But out there, unless you wear the fur of the animals your eagle has dived for, you simply won't survive the winter. So this here is Aishalpan's eagle huntress hat. She gave it to me. This is something that her eagle dived for. This is a Mongolian fox. That's its body, his head, his or her head, the tail, the leg. Unfortunately, fortunately, or fortunately, maybe, you guys can't smell it. it smells quite bad. Um, but there we go for Aishalpan's eagle huntress hat. So all those adventures combined to make my book Sky Song. Now, we've got a very different book coming up now. What have we got next? So, the idea for my brand new series that we can see on the next slide here, um, The Unmapped Chronicles, which you don't need to, be, um, to read in order. You can read them in any which way you like because they're all standalone adventures. The idea for my brand new series, The Unmapped Chronicles, started in here. You can see the next slide. It started as a, a what if, an accidental daydream in here. Now, I don't know if you guys can guess what this building is. The last school said, is it a chicken coop? Um, and one school before that said, is it a public toilet? I just want to assure you that I didn't come up with my idea for my brand new series, Sitting on the Loo. Um, this is in fact my writing shed, because if we go to the next slide, you can see that inside it's much bigger than you might think. Um, you've got my writing desk there where I sit and write my stories. You've got the chair where I read um, everything from picture books and fairy tales and non-fiction photography books to gather, gather ideas in for my stories. And you can see at the bottom left my ideas collector. So sometimes I'm writing one book and then I get an idea for another but I'm not quite ready to write about it. I had that yesterday where I was in the car and I passed a street name called Winterbourne and I thought that would be such a cool surname for a character but I wasn't ready to write about that yet so I logged it, I wrote it down on a scrap of paper and then I tucked it into one of those compartments in the ideas collector. So I've gotten a compartment for names, one for magical creatures, one for remote cultures because I like writing about people who live at the edges of our world in the wild. So you can do the same thing with an egg box. Six compartments. You could label each compartment as a different type of idea. Magical portals to secret kingdoms. Names. Quirky methods of transport. All those kind of things. Magical creatures. Then you store up lots of different ideas in each box. And by the end of the week, sometimes by the end of a day, you've got a whole treasure trove of ideas to write about. So I was sitting in this writing shed and I was thinking back if you can go to the next slide, um, to all the incredible skies that I'd seen on my adventures. Pink sunrises, orange sunsets, rain that conjures rainbows and makes waterfalls roar, frost that catches on a single spiderweb and lights it up so it looks like it's frosted jewellery. And I started thinking, what if the grown-ups have got it all wrong about our skies? 
What if it's not science and geography behind the weather, but magic? What if there are four secret kingdoms? Rumble Star, Jungle Drop, Silver Crag and Crackle Dawn, filled to the brim with magical beasts all beavering away to make weather for our world. Maybe you could have snow trolls beavering away with moon syrup and cloud whisk to make snow, and drizzle hags brewing rain in dry, giant cauldrons. And so this idea of the unmapped kingdoms came about. Now, each book in this series is an adventure that follows a different child from our world who finds a way through to the magical kingdoms, and they have to save the unmapped magic from an evil harpy called Morg, who is bent on stealing it. So in Jungle Drop, you can see from the next slide, there's the cover. In Jungle Drop, you meet 11-year-old twins, Fox and Fibber, Petty Squabble, who have been rivals for as long as they can remember. Only one of them will inherit the family fortune. And so a race is afoot to save the dwindling um, Petty Squabble empire and win the love of their parents. But when the twins are whisked off to Jungle Drop, an unmapped kingdom in charge of conjuring weather for our world, and in particular rain for our world, they must join forces in a race against time to find the legendary Forever Fern before Morg. Because if the evil harpy finds this Forever Fern first, then our world and all the magical kingdoms will crumble. But if the twins can find the fern first, they'll save the world, restore rain to our world, and keep the unmapped kingdoms safe. So they find themselves thrust headlong into an adventure in an incredible glow-in-the-dark rainforest. Now, I was lucky enough to get out to Brazil before writing this book. You can see from the next slide here. I was lucky enough to get out to a place called the Pantanal, which is the world's largest tropical wetland. It's an enormous patchwork of lagoons, marshes and swamps and lakes, sprawling Bolivia, Brazil and Paraguay. And it's home to 4,700 plant and animal species, making it one of the most biologically diverse places on Earth. So out there, I snorkelled in the Olhudagua River, you can see the next slide, amongst some very frightening creatures. I snorkelled amongst piranhas, paku and anacondas, the world's largest snake, some of them weighing in at a colossal 200 kilograms. I was terrified when I stepped into that river. But I like to think, what lies beyond fear? What might we discover? And who might we be if we're brave enough to push past being frightened? So that river, when I stepped inside it and I started snorkelling, turned out to be a light-filled temple of wonder. Unlike many rainforest rivers, which are really murky in colour, this river passes over a limestone cast and that purifies the water. There are lots of minerals in it and it's crystal clear. And in just this single mile long stretch of river, there were 65 types of fish, as well as alligators and giant otters. And it made for an amazing place to set a story. Um, you can see, I think, from the next slide, if we go one more on, here we go. Um, this is me abseiling into a jungle cave. So during my stay in the Pantanal, I also abseiled 75 metres down into a jungle cave. You wouldn't know that this cave, Abysmo Animus it was called, existed. There was just a tiny opening in the foliage, in the leaves in the jungle. But if you peered inside, you could see there was an almighty drop. And so I abseiled 70 metres, 75 metres down into this cave, past walls that had never seen sunlight. And I thought when I got to the bottom that I'd be at the end of my adventure. But there was an underground lake at the bottom. You can see on this next slide here. There you go. There was an underground lake at the bottom of this cave. And I ended up snorkelling inside it. The lake went a further 75 metres down into the centre of the earth. So it was like being locked in the very bowels of the earth, deep underground. Again, a, a place that felt so full of magic and so full of stories. And it was perishingly cold in this lake, but I swam in it nonetheless. And I ended up writing about a lake a little bit like this and a cave a little bit like this um, called Cragheart in Jungle Drop. So the tropical world of the Pantanal and its surrounding areas built my fictional world in Jungle Drop. Its pink trumpet trees became my gobblequick trees in Jungle Drop. Its marsh deer, deer became my swift wings. They're a bit like hippogriffs, but a lot clumsier. 
Um, and its jaguars became my golden panthers. The caves, as I said, became Cragheart. Um, but with Jungle Drop, I wanted to write a story that not only celebrated the natural world and the wonders of the wild, but also one that highlighted its fragility. Because due to infrastructure and untreated waste pollution and deforestation, the Pantanal, which provides food and water to millions of people, is running out. It's, it's vanishing. And by 2050, it could be gone completely if we don't take action now. So I have in Jungle Drop a jungle on the brink of ruin. It's a glow-in-the-dark rainforest filled with magical beasts, but when the twins, Fox and Fibber, arrive, things aren't looking so good. The thunderberry bushes are withering, withering away, magical creatures are struggling to survive, and the gobblequit trees are, dry, are dying, and it's up to Fox and Fibber, Petty Squabble, to step in and set things right. So you do not need to go to the jungle to write a book about a rainforest. All you need, as I said, is an idea that nobody else has stumbled across yet. Um, so once you've got an idea, it may be sparked out of something you've seen just walking outside your house or something inside your house, or maybe just because you've got a crazy good imagination. Once you've got this idea, you need to think about how can I turn it into a book? Where do I go from there? How can I write a really brilliant story? So I think there are five steps to building a, building a magical world, basically, and building it really well. And if you do each step really well, I think you're in, the in with the chance of creating a fantastic, best-selling, fantastical adventure book. So the first thing is, how do you get your characters from our world to a magical world? So you can see on this next slide here, the portal. So Jungle Drop opens with Fibber announcing that he's moments away from revealing his master plan to save the family fortune. Filled with panic, because if her brother wins the love of their parents and restores the family fortune, Fox will be sent away to Antarctica and politely wish the very best. So Fox snatches Fibber's briefcase, which contains the master plan, and she legs it out of the hotel they're staying in the Neverwrinkle Hotel. She rushes down the street and she's thinking, where can I hide this briefcase and dispose of Fibber's plan so that I don't get sent away? And she sees a train parked up in the station in Mizzelgurg, the village that this hotel is in. And she jumps aboard it because she thinks, I can hide the briefcase in here. But then the train starts moving. And it's only when Fox is on the train and it's starting chugging quite fast away from the station that she realises this is a very old-fashioned steam train and the steam pumping out of the chimney is bright green. Not only that, the carriage is filled to the brim with magical creatures. And the next stop is the glow-in-the-dark rainforest of Jungle Drop. So your portal doesn't need to be a train like mine. Mine is the Here and There Express. It's here one minute and then gone the next, vanishes. Um, yours could be a grandfather clock in Rumble Star, the first book in the Unmapped Chronicles. Um, the main character, Casper Tock, steps inside a grandfather clock and he ends up finding a way through it into a magical world. C.S. Lewis in The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe used a wardrobe. Um, Northern Lights, um, Philip Pullman's trilogy, His Dark Materials, they used, or Will, the main character, used a knife, a subtle knife, to cut a way through into a magical kingdom. So you could have an elevator, um, a mirror, a wardrobe, whatever you like. Usually it's an object that a character either holds or steps through to get into a magical kingdom. What happens when your characters arrive in your magical world? When I sit down to write a story, my ideas are a total mess. I'm dyslexic, so I have to draw my way into my stories. That's how I untangle the knots inside my brain. So you can see on this next slide, the map. I didn't draw this map, my illustrator did, but I drew him a rough map in pencil with lots of scratchings and scribbles and he then turned it into this brilliant map here which goes in at the front of Jungle Drop. So I draw my way into my stories. I draw a world I'd love to visit. So in Jungle Drop I put on lots of places that my characters could visit. Um, I drew on enchanted temples, huge ravines, um, cursed lakes, 
forests and sort of creepy forests that would have extraordinary plants that would do certain things if you um, break off a leaf. So I have all these crazy places in this magical rainforest. And then I imagine my characters journeying through this land. I get another coloured pen and I draw a journey. And then I imagine that stuff happens at various junctures in this journey. So maybe the characters are kidnapped here. Maybe they find a secret object there. Maybe they're reunited here. So the writer Vladimir Nabokov once said, the writer's job is to get their main character up a tree. And then once they're up there, throw rocks at them. That's essentially all you're doing in your story. You're making stuff happen to your main character. So once I've got this journey, that then becomes my plot. and I'm starting to write. I'm feeling more confident. So if you struggle with turning ideas into a book or if you're dyslexic, then draw your way in. The next slide, the transport. How do your characters get around when they get into this magical world? So the quirkier the better with transport. In Jungle Drop, characters ride on enchanted unicycles over treetop creepers. They're linked in this network of creepers that forms the hustle way. So you can get across the rainforest by travelling on these unicycles all the way through the creepers. In Rumble Star, the characters travel from place to place in enchanted hot air balloons powered by um, dragon fire. So you guys could have any kind of quirky um, method of transport and you could just tweak it slightly and fill it with magic and that will mean that it's exciting for your reader to read your characters moving from A to B. It's not just a slog if your characters are running here and there and everywhere. Jazz it up with some quirky methods of transport. Now the next one, I think it's number four, yes, the next slide, four. Do your characters have any help in the form of magic? The best kind of magic, for me, hinges on the pos possible. So I like to take an ordinary object and then ask myself, what if this ordinary object could do something extraordinary? So you can see from the next slide here, yes, um, I have an, a sort of item here, um, a blank piece of parchment. And in Jungle Drop, Fibber and Fox are given this blank piece of parchment. And they think, well, this isn't going to help me save the world. This is going to help me beat a harpy and find the forever fern. But they don't know that this old piece of parchment is actually a flicker tug map. It's imbued with loads of magic. They're also given two more objects um, to save the world. One of which is a mirror and the other is a spoon. Can you imagine if you were asked to save the world and someone gave you a spoon? But this spoon is not an ordinary spoon, it's a fable spoon. And this mirror is a double skin mirror. So these can do magical things. I'm not gonna spoil it and tell you exactly what they can do. Um, but the key is to pick an ordinary object and turn it on its head. What if that object could do something extraordinary? Now, the next slide, we've got another slide. Yes, here we go. Um, Number five, when you're building this magical world, what's your book's message? What are you really writing about? So on the surface of things, I write adventure books. And Jungle Drop is an adventure story. But really it's a story about two kids finding their way with the help of a flicker tug map and of them realising what most grown-ups take a lifetime to understand, but kindness to each other, to the planet, and perhaps hardest of all, to ourselves is what holds kingdoms and worlds together. Now to finish, if we go to the next slide, I'm going to show you my top three tips if any of you guys want to become writers one day. So number one, if we can go here, is carry a notebook with you everywhere. As a writer you're like a detective, you just watch the world fiercely for the things that other people miss. Number two, look up and out from your screens. Nobody and I mean nobody, is going to get to the age of 100 and say, I just wish I'd spent more time on my mobile phone. So look an up and out from your screens. The world is filled with wonder, especially the wild, and go and find your stories there. And number three, never be afraid to fail. So it took me seven years, 96 rejections from literary agents, and three failed books um, to become an author. To, to get my first book deal. 
So never be afraid to fail. I think that the people who get where they want to go are the people who are brave enough to fail, who are brave enough to get it wrong. So never give up. Um, now, I think we've got time to do some questions, a few Q&A questions. I know some of you guys have sent those in and I'm going to read them off for you now. Um, and also, um, I'm going to do a really short reading from my book, Jungle Drop, as well, which you can listen to if you want to or listen to later or whatever, or not listen to at all, whatever you want. Um, I'd also like to say that the wonderful Stroud Bookshop is providing signed copies of all of my books. So if there's any book that you like the look of, you can see some of them behind me now, um, then, and you want a signed copy, then you can just get in touch with Stroud Bookshop and they will sort that out for you. So questions, I'm going to need my phone, my Unmap Chronicles phone for this bit. So I have a question from Scarlett who asks, how big is the world of Jungle Drop? What a great question, Charlotte, uh, Scarlett. So I like to think that each of my unmapped kingdoms is a vast world. I remember being out in the Pantanal and walking for miles and miles and miles through the jungle and not seeing the same animal species twice. Um, and I like to think that in Jungle Drop, the world is vast too. You could walk for days and days and not see the same animal or magical creature twice. So it's vast, it's big, you can't see the edges of it. Um, Hector, 10 years old, asks, what got you interested in nature? So I think it was growing up in Scotland. I was lucky enough to grow up in the middle of nowhere. And so most of my time playing was playing outside. I was exploring the farm opposite my house, building dens in the woods, um, hunting for waterfalls on the moors, like I said to you guys earlier. So I think the wilderness made me a writer. Um, I think my dad, who knew, who, or who still does know the name of every single flower and plant and bird and animal, he got me interested. Because I think sometimes if you can name the things that you're seeing in the wild, it makes you even more passionate about them. Um, Luca asks, who, what, or where do you get ideas from for your books? Um, hopefully the talk has just answered that, um, that it's from accidental daydreams, it's from adventures in far-flung pl places, and simply kicking around the world, just walking out of my door, going into TK Maxx, or seeing a signpost and popping a word from that into my books. Um, Luca also asks, where do you like to write your books? Um, I write either in the shed in my garden or I write when there isn't a pandemic on buses and on trains. I do a lot of school visits. So when I'm on the train towards visiting a school, I write on the train. Um, I write anywhere, basically. Once I wrote a line of a book on the back of a motorbike. My husband was driving and I was on the back and I was on deadline and I wanted to get the book in for the deadline. So I tried to write on the back of the motorbike, but it didn't work. Uh, but yeah, I write anywhere, anywhere I can. Um, and Scarlett again asks, what can we do to help stop climate change? Um, and she says, I help by doing gardening club at school and I plant vegetables. Scarlett, you sound truly awesome. Um, I would love to meet you one day. Um, what can you guys do to um, save the planet? So a number of things. First of all, I think you've got to fall in love with the wild if you want to protect it. So get outside and explore the beautiful world we live in. Um, read adventure stories set in the wild, like Piers Torday's books and Lauren St. John's books and Catherine Rundle's books. Um, look at wildlife photography and see how incredible some of the creatures are in this planet. There's an amazing Wildlife Photographer of the Year exhibition at the Natural History Museum. If it's shut due to COVID, then go online and you can see the entries. They're phenomenal. Um, but get outside and fall in love with the world. And then once you love it, <laughs> then you'll feel really passionate, I think, about trying to save it. And you can save it in a number of ways. You can do um, chores around the house that could save it. You could power down computers when you're not using them, drink tap water instead of bottled water, turn off the lights when you use um, when you leave a room, donate old clothes and um, toys to charity shops, shops instead of just chucking them in the bin. You can use beeswax in, wax instead of cling film. Um, if you want to go a little bit bigger, you can set up a fundraiser, um, Born Free, if you go to their website, to have incredible posters of animals that you can raise money to save, like the endangered snow leopard. And you can go onto the website um, 
authorsforoceans.org um, and sign a pledge to reduce the amount of plastic you use. Because if we carry on using the, the plastic at the rate we are now, there are going to be more, there's going to be more plastic in the ocean than fish by 2050. So there are tons of things that you guys can do to save our world. Thank you for those questions, Scarlett. Um, there were a few extra questions that came in. Which of the books you've written is your favourite? I used to say Sky Song. You can see that one here. Um, Sky Song was my favourite um, and still is in some ways. It's a, a book set in a snowy kingdom, as I was talking about, um, with the eagle huntress and the inventor boy and the organ made of icicles. And there were urken bears and homes, hidden homes inside mountains. Um, I loved snowy stories as a child, like Northern Lights, The Wolves of Willoughby Chase and The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe and The Snow Queen by Hans Christian Andersen. So I always wanted to write a snowy tale. And this is the book that I wrote because of that. Um, but I also really, really loved writing the Unmapped Chronicles books. I think they're the funniest ones I've written. They're also scary in parts and filled with magic, um, but they're funny too, I hope. And I adored writing Jungle Drop and also Rumble Star. As I said, you don't need to read them in order. Um, if you want to read about a sky kingdom, a world set up above the clouds um, with a castle built on the back of sleeping cloud giants ruled by wizards with unending pockets, go for this book. If you want to read about glow-in-the-dark rainforests, read about Jungle Drop. And then The Crackle Dawn Dragon is a book set in Crackle Dawn and Silver Crag, those two kingdoms, and that comes out in May. Um, do you need to read the Unmapped Chronicles in order? Nope, you don't. Um, which unmapped kingdom would you like to live in? Oh, tricky one. I like the idea of living up in the clouds. I love that, I don't know if any of you guys have been in an aeroplane, but I love that if you're in an aeroplane and you look out the window and maybe when you have taken off from the plane, maybe from Heathrow or something in London, it had been all gloomy and rainy. Um, but when you're above the clouds and you look out of the window in the aeroplane, you can see a layer of clouds and then a burning blue sky. And you think that is so beautiful and the world is like a different place up here above the clouds. So I'd love to live in Rumble Star in, up in this sky kingdom. Um, but I would also really, really like to live in Jungle Drop because I think the idea of a glow in the dark rainforest would be super cool. Um, what was you, Who was your favourite author when you were at school? Um, I loved Jill Murphy, who wrote the worst witch books. Um, Mildred Hubble was the heroine, and she was clumsy and a little bit hopeless, um, turned up late for things, but she always tried really hard, and she was loyal to her friends and brave and kind. And so I think she taught me a lot about forming friendships as a child. I also loved Northern Lights by Philip Pullman because Lyra Balacqua, the main character, taught me that girls can be just as brave as boys, grown-ups, and even armoured polar bears. How long does it take to write a book? This is the second last question. Um, it takes me about a year to write a book. Um, six months to come up with the idea and plan it and research it, and then six months to write it and edit it and edit it and edit it. Um, I don't know if it's the same with you guys, but when I was young, I used to write a story and hand it into my English teacher, and I used to think, well, that's quite good. Um, and then the teacher would come back and say, I think you should put a simile in the opening paragraph. I think you should put every metaphor there ever was in the closing paragraph. And you're like, shut up. And I used to think like that very arrogantly. Um, and then I got to the grand old age of 30 and I started writing books for a living and I got a, an editor and I send my editor my books and she always comes back and says, oh, what about doing this to the opening paragraph? What about putting a prologue into Sky Song? And I say, no, no, shut up. And then I go and do all the things she says and it makes it a much better book. So, yeah, listen to your teachers. They'll be full of brilliant comments to make your books a lot, I don't know, better and more exciting. Um, and the last question is, how many books have you written? I've written eight. Um, we can see most of them here. So this one, the first one, The Dream Snatcher, followed by The Shadow Keeper and The Night Spinner. That's the first trilogy. Then Sky Song. And then 
Everdark, which was a World Book Day book, a one pound book, one of the ones you got free. Um, but we're republishing it in January with a brand new cover. And in it's also got a dyslexic friendly font and paper. So for anyone with dyslexia, um, that book's being republished so that it's super easy to read. Um, then there's Jungle Drop and Rumble Star, and there's a picture book called The Snow Goblin, which um, yeah has loads and loads of pictures by a very talented illustrator called Fiona Woodcock. Um, thank you so much for your questions, guys. They were brilliant. Um, and I think from this rabble on my bed, whether rubble on my bed, um, dyslexic, see, using all the wrong words at all the wrong times, um, I think I'm going to try and do a reading for you guys now, um, a really quick reading. Um, from Jungle Drop. So, um, let me see. It's page 32 and 33 if you guys have got the books yourselves so you can follow along. Um, I'm going to read you an extract um, from Jungle Drop. And as much as I wish that I could introduce you to a boy and a girl brimming with charm for this story, I'm afraid I can't. Because the Petty Squabble Twins have as much charm as a politician's underpants. Um, but just because someone has a sharp tongue and a thorny heart at 11 years old, it doesn't mean that they're going to stay that way forever. Quite the contrary. Children, I've discovered, are remarkably bendy creatures. Um, just when you think you've got the measure of them, they end up twisting and turning and surprising you altogether. Even the truly dreadful ones, like Fox and Fibber Petty Squabble. In fact, sometimes it's children like them who make for the most interesting heroes of all. So... The following extract is taken from chapter three of Jungle Drop, and the book opens, as I was saying earlier, with Fibber announcing he's moments away from revealing his master plan to restore the family fortune. Filled with panic, Fox snatches his briefcase containing the master plan, legs it out of the hotel, runs down the street, and before she jumps on the train that whisks her away to jump Jungle Drop, she runs into an old antiques shop. And in there, she encounters a mysterious old man called Casper Tock. And he gives her a glowing marble and tells her that it's a portal to a magical kingdom. So, Casper dipped his head at Fox. Take the marble. Then run, girl. Run headlong into this adventure. The Unmapped Chronicles. The Unmapped Kingdoms, not Chronicles. I'm going to start that again. He, um, Casper dipped his head at Fox. Take the marble. Then run, girl, run headlong into this adventure. The unmapped kingdoms have chosen you. And when magic sets its sights on someone, it's remarkably hard to wriggle free. Fox blinked. The old man was off his rocker. He had to be. But her plans lay in tatters. Fibber was on the brink of victory. And there was something about this marble burning in the gloom. Something wild and hopeful. She grabbed it from Casper's outstretched palm, just as Fibber was raising his briefcase in triumph. Then she turned and fled from the shop. Fox tore back down the street. She couldn't go back to the hotel because her parents had been very clear. Come up with a plan or be posted to Antarctica. She had to get away from here, immediately. And yet she had no idea where to go. She hastened on down the street. Then the train station came into view once again and Fox felt the marble tingle in her hand. Without thinking, she turned into the station, rushed past the empty ticket office and onto the echoing platform, and there, like a gift, a glorious, hope-giving chance of a gift was a train. And so strong was the pull of escape, of freedom, that Fox didn't stop to consider that this train was a very old-fashioned steam train, and that the steam pumping out of the chimney was, in fact, bright green. She gripped the marble tightly, hurried along the platform, and though she didn't know where the train was going to, she leapt aboard. She turned to see Fibber dashing towards her. What was he doing? He had been desperate to find his briefcase, and yes, he wasn't, it appeared, desperate to hurry back to their parents to reveal the master plan inside it. Had he been lying about the contents? What if his briefcase didn't hold a genius business plan? Fox felt sure, though, that Fibber had something of value inside it, something he didn't want to lose. The train started chugging forward slowly, and Fibber quickened his pace, throwing himself aboard just before the train gathered more speed, and Fox realised then that her world which had seemed so ugly and unchanging before, now looked ever so slightly different. There were surprises and secrets bound up inside it. Why on earth, for instance, had her brother followed her onto this train? But it was only when the train doors snapped shut and Fox glanced down the carriage, 
that she realised her world was filled to the brim with magic too. I hope you guys have enjoyed that. Um, I'm so sorry I wasn't able to come to your school in person, but I'm wishing you a wonderful rest of the term. And remember to keep reading lots. Books make you kinder and infinitely more interesting. Bye. Thank you so much, Abby, for an absolutely brilliant and fantastically inspirational session. I'm sure all the children watching enjoyed it thoroughly too. I'd also like to thank our sponsors, ALCS, for very kindly sponsoring the event. If you'd like to buy the books afterwards, please try and buy them at your local bookshop. There's also a link available on our website to do so. And thank you again, Abby, for an absolutely wonderful session.